Now, will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we let you go. God, as Cornelius so led us so well, Lord, we need to release control to you because we've got to trust you. Lord, so many times we hold on so tightly to our own agendas, to making things work, to work out worries, to think it's all on our shoulders. But God, you say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I pray whatever we're coming from today, that you continue to shape us into your character and make us people who trust you with our lives, with our future, with our kids, with our friends, with our school, with our future. Lord, we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great. Hey, it's good to hear the good voices here. I like that. Hey, uh, if I've not met you, I'm John Fanus, one of the pastors here at University Covenant. Welcome. We are finishing the fourth, we are in the fourth week of a four-week series on Vision 2008. For those of you who are just joining us, our church is uh, in the middle of a huge reorganization, really getting clarity about who we are as a church, where we're going, how we're going to be organized, and even more importantly, how you can be involved in, in, uh, in what God is doing. Uh, this reorganization is happening this summer but we want to give you just some insight about what's going on. And I have just been so excited about this morning because of our special guests. Um, We're going to focus on the whole idea of unleashing compassion. Really quick, our vision uh, moving forward is that all people would know Jesus. Let's go to the slide that has the uh, three circles in it. Um, and we've been talking about that for all people who know Jesus, we're going to focus on three things throughout our ministries, that we're going to make disciples, make followers of Jesus, to multiply our leadership so we can reach more people, and to unleash compassion. This week, we're going to focus on unleash compassion, and it really deals with how we're organizing. We're going to have five different departments. Um, a few weeks ago, we talked about our Sunday gathering department that focuses everything that hope, uh, happens on Sunday mornings, from our worship to our hospitality. Talked about small groups and fellowship, our ability to connect with one another, and that God actually shapes our character to be more in line with who he has us to be through, being in relationship with one another. We also uh, talked about youth and children, children and youth, that uh, this is integrated to everything we do. We have a new executive uh, leaders on each of these. So we have Kyle Thompson overseeing Sunday gatherings. We have uh, um, uh, Amy Duffy overseeing children and and youth. Um, We have uh, Glenn Nielsen overseeing support services. How many of you were here last week when Glenn was sharing? I just want to say I'm sorry. That's all I want to say. (laughs) It's a little crazy. We're working now. Glenn's great. We love him to death. Um, And uh, we're going to be focusing on the whole idea of compassion and outreach today. And uh, towards the end, we're going to have Pastor Schumann come up and share his heart because he'll be overseeing that department. But underneath that department comes all our local and uh, international outreach. Um, And uh, what's just fascinating is to understand that the founding of our church over 50 years ago started out of compassion and outreach, this idea that there were more people to be reached. In 1963, there was a letter written... um, uh, by leaders in our church about why this church was founded. It was a small town. Davis was a small town back then, but there was a university. There were people who worked in Sacramento living in Davis, and they realized there's so many unreached uh, people in our community. I want to show you a quote from a document in 1963. Let's uh, go to that. It says, it's the vision of, those, of ministering to these people. So referring to all these people in Davis who are unreached, it's the vision of ministering to these people, many of them unchurched, which stimulated the group to think of beginning a work in Davis. It's how this church started uh, over 50 years ago, and what's amazing is that one of the uh, initial impulses of our church is right away we began to pray for and send missionaries out um, uh, throughout our church history. We've been sending people out internationally and locally to serve God's purposes, um, and almost all of our missionaries actually are people who actually were in this church before they were sent out. Well, this is why I'm excited about this morning. We have our first ever missionary at our church sent here uh, as a guest right now. Uh, and I want to invite Rich and Jackie Manson up right now so we can hear from them. Will you just give them a round of applause? Please? this to you. Yeah, a little different. So uh, just so you know, uh, Jackie and her late husband were charter members of our church. Her late husband's signature is on our charter. Uh, Rich uh, and also lost his spouse and they got married on the mission field and uh, we love them dearly. I got to spend a little time with them this morning and they are a hoot. We are laughing. We, we store our, if you've seen our baptisms, we actually baptism, baptize people in a it's a horse trough, but don't tell anyone. And we store it in the back on this shelf. So if you go in our back, 
back, and uh, Rich saw that. He's like, so how do people get up there to get, ba- get baptized? <laughs> I'm like, I like this guy already. So uh, Jackie, tell us a little bit about how you received the call to become a missionary in this church, and what role did our early church have in that call? That's a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I do, really the message that I have is, um, it goes way, way back, like uh, 69 years, and I was a 15-year-old in high school, that was Southern California, and I didn't come from a Christian family, I didn't go to church, there was no one to tell me about Jesus, um, except my high school friend, probably, just just hold on with me. I'll get through this. <laughs> um, so Bobby, it wasn't an, an overnight thing, except, well, I can, I've got to make this short. Uh, <laughs> Bobby kept telling me what a wonderful thing it was to belong to Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> and, and, but it didn't come overnight, so perseverance, a year and a half. Um, going to Youth for Christ with Bobby and doing this and doing that and hearing the word, I finally realized, yes, this is the way I need to go. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And um, the climax, really, of this, this whole thing is that right, right then I knew he was to be the boss. Hmm. Like, Lord, they call it now, Lord, Master. I was only, by that time, I was 16, so any of you who are working with teens or children, yep. go for it. Yes, that's right. Go for it. And so I'm, I can stand before you today, and I can say yes, and all the songs that they were singing, new songs for me, but I thought, okay, river, river, what's the river? And then I thought, oh, yeah, Jesus says, anyone who follows me, out of him will flow rivers of learning. So I think each of those songs would make a, a good Bible study to find out where, <laughs> where it comes from. <laughs> Um, the other important thing was that I had a Bible of my own. My grandmother had given me the Bible. I was not a Christian, but I had the Bible in English, my language. Uh, and so, therefore, as the years went by, I realized that the best thing I could do, I had a little, little bit of knack for that sort of thing, best thing I could do would be maybe to give the word to somebody who didn't have it in their language. Uh, and so that's why I, uh, why Skip and I got into Bible translation with Wycliffe Bible translators. That's wonderful. And Jackie, what role did this early church have in that whole process? Yes, yeah, thank you. I forgot. That's why I'm here. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. I, I, it was 1963. When I married uh, Skip Froco, you know, one of your charter members, uh, and we settled in Davis uh, for a year and a half. Um, he graduated from UCD, and he, well, later on he did his master's at UCD, uh, so we kept coming back. Um, and the church, we, we actually left on a ship in 1964 for Papua New Guinea, um, and we had five-year terms at that time, but every time we came back, uh, we came to Davis. And, and, and by the way, everybody from the church there, actually, it wasn't a church. Uh, we met in the park. I remember that. Mm-hmm. In the park, you didn't have a building, and I don't think it really had a name, but, but that was the beginning. Um, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm thinking fast. What's the conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> this is the conclusion. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Jack. Great. So, uh, oh no, we have more questions oh. for you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, can give you can give sure you can give it away. Uh, so you have been um, our longest missionaries. We've been uh, partnering with you for over 50 years. Tell us a little bit about your work. What do you do? So we know. <laughs> we translate the Bible. All right. <laughs> for those who haven't the Bible in their own language and who continue to use their own language and depend upon it. And the Lord led Scott, Skip and Jackie to Papua New Guinea. He led Karis and me to Colombia and Venezuela. And so it takes a little while to learn the language, which is an unwritten language, to give them a form of writing, to prepare material so they can learn to read. And so both the people that they worked with, the Rodakos, 
people that Karis and I worked with in Colombia and in Venezuela, the YU, have now the Bible, the New Testament, and some of the Old Testament in their language. Great. And uh, just so we're connecting the dots here, if you guys remember in our season of giving, we gave money to Gifts from the Heart, and one of that was for uh, the YU Bible Translation. This is who we work through. Uh, church, by God's grace, we raised $27,000 to give to the cause. Can you tell us, how, what, what does that do? Connect the dots for us so we know how God will use that money. Well, I mentioned this morning, when I committed my life to the Lord as an engineering student at the University of Illinois, then I bought my first Bible. And it would be good, I had it. What if I had to say to my dad, Dad, I don't have a Bible. He says, well, there's none available. They all sold out. That's the case with the YU people. 14 years ago, they received 10,000 copies. Now that's a lot, but a population of 400,000 doesn't go very far. And in those 14 years, that church has grown. Now it took 40 years to give them that Bible, that New Testament, a long time. But now the church has grown. There's a new generation who are learning to read. They're teenagers. Some of them are still brats. Some of them are little, <laughs> little, little guys. But they need their own copy of the New Testament. And that's what this church has done by raising that $27,000. Got 5,000 copies. Two weeks ago, those files, those digital files, were sent to Korea to begin the printing process. Great. Within months, they should be on a ship down to South America. And this new generation then will have Bibles in their own hands, not just borrowing their dad's Bible. And they will be the future pastors. Many of them are. Their children will be leaders. They will be able to evangelize in two countries, Colombia and Venezuela, and reach these 400,000 people with the gospel. Yeah. That's what this church has had a part in. And it's, Great. it's my, and they're shouting hooray, and they're saying <laughs> thank you. Anayawatsa, they would say to them, to you all Can the time. Can you teach I us that? I wish they were here today. Say that one more time. Anayawatsa. All right, you guys. Anayawatsa. <laughs> And the uh, ha is really important. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, church, you know this, but I just want to remind us, everything we do is really on the shoulders of others who have gone before us. Would you agree? And uh, you guys have paved the way for our church to be a mission and outreach-focused church. Thank you for being our first missionaries. Uh, we love you, and we're grateful for you. And I think we just want to give you a standing ovation for the work you've done. So you can join us. Thank you, church. You can, you can be seated. Thank you. So uh, we're going to focus on compassion and outreach this morning. Just a few, uh, just a few little uh, announcements. One is our college group, Calist, uh, went on a retreat last weekend. We had uh, 60 or 70 uh, college students there. I think we have a picture coming up. Yep, there they are. Uh, last week I mentioned that they were in Santa Cruz. I was wrong. They were actually in Marin, but I got the coast right, so that's good. Uh, but they had a great time. We're glad to have them back. And then our high school youth are on a retreat this weekend as well. So just keep them in your prayers. I know that our church is doing a lot these days and ministering to our youth, our college students, and children as well. Uh, just another plea, and it's a selfish plea. Uh, we have a lot of staff changes. Um, some of our administrative assistants are retiring or having babies, and we need to rejoice that even though we're losing them. And so we are hiring uh, uh, admin assistants and executive assistants. If you know someone who would love to serve in that capacity, please have them apply. All the information is in your program. You can go online uh, as well for that. So uh, what we want to do, we're going to read two different passages this morning. One will be from James chapter 2. And the other will be from Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, your phones, go ahead and turn them on, open them up. James chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2. We'll start with James chapter 2, uh, verse 14. James chapter 2, verse, verse 14. We'll read a few verses here. James is writing to the Christians and he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters... If someone claims to have faith, but no deeds, can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. 
If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Okay, we'll take that. Now turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2. And it's a description of the early church, a very popular passage. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says this. They, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Catch this. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We'll end there with those two verses. What I'd like to do this morning is um, I'm not going to preach too long because we'll have Pastor Schumann come up in a moment, but just review where we've been in these last four weeks just so we're all on the same page. Our hope is we would all catch a glimpse of what God has for us, understand our vision, that you would actually have a sense of excitement and and know where you fit, where we belong, because this is an us thing. This is a we thing. We're all in this together. And that you'd be able to meet the different members of our executive team. As I shared, Pastor Schumann's going to take on our Compassion Outreach Department. But just a reminder, we started several weeks ago with the whole idea that God has called us uh, to see that all people would know him. It's part of our founding. We really believe that the best gift Jesus, God has given us is Jesus himself. So we have a passion for people to know Jesus. That we do this by making disciples, by multiplying leaders, and by unleashing compassion. Likewise, we, we are reorganizing so that all of our ministries, all of the things you're involved in are organized into five different departments. We have support services that, that uh, undergird all these things. And the four main ministry initiatives are Sunday gatherings. Uh, the next would be small groups and fellowship. The third would be uh, compassion outreach. And the fourth would be children and youth. And I'm struck that in the early church, we see all these things going on. When it comes to Sunday gatherings and the idea of worship, in Acts chapter 2, 42, this is what the early church was doing. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to actually hearing God's word, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, that's sharing communion, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs being performed by the apostles. Later it says that they met together in the temple courts. It's this idea that who we are as a church is that we are a worshiping community, that, that uh, we want to have a relationship with God that, that looks up and that all good things come from him, and that we are prayerful as well. And our vision is that we would really, and if you heard Pastor Kyle several weeks ago, to really up the sense of hospitality in our church, that we would have a a worship gathering that's transcendent, brings us into God's presence, and warm where the outsider was welcomed in. And so we have uh, ideas and plans for really having uh, seven points of touch to to rethink how we do our lobby, to, to hire a worship director and have all these things in place so that we could actually be a worshiping community, and that those who come in would feel the warmth of this Christian community and understand that God loves them. And so a lot of effort will be going into that as well. We also want to give our younger generations, our our college and and young adults, a voice in shaping our worship services so that we can reach out to the next generation as well. Then we talked about small groups and fellowship, and we talked about how the way God shapes us and makes us into who we truly are in him is through relationships with one another, that, that your friendships are a better predictor to who, of who you will be than your actual personal resolve. And so how important it is that each of us is involved in a small group Bible study. Each of us is studying God's word together and growing alongside one another. We'll be hiring a pastor of small groups. Pray for that process as well. We're excited about what's next. But we really want to see more small groups start. We want them to invest in the small groups that are here. We want to help our leaders. We want to multiply new leaders. We really believe that there are more people to be reached and new groups reach new people. So we're excited about what God's going to do in the small group area. And we see that even in this early church, that the believers were together and had everything in common. They enjoyed each other's fellowship. They broke bread in their homes. And there's a sense of that we're in this together and our relationships together is what God is using to shape us. Connected to that, obviously, is is that this early church met in their homes and just implied that the whole family was involved. 
which is why we give so much effort to our children and youth program. Uh, we're already planning for breakaway this summer. Isn't that crazy? Uh, we're going to have 400 plus kids and volunteers this summer as we reach out to our community in Jesus' name. We have wonderful youth groups in our, in our children's ministry as well. And this early church spent time in their homes where youth and children were involved in what they were doing. And our early time in this church was our, our kids and youth were involved in the founding of this church as well. And finally, we have compassion and outreach. And uh, James chapter 2 talked about faith without works is dead. And that you can't just believe in Jesus and not have it show up in how you treat another person. That faith, our hope in Jesus, and what we do come together. If you're in a boat with two oars and one is faith and one is deeds, if you just row with faith, all you do is go in a circle. If you just row with deeds, all you do is go in a circle. But when... You row with faith and deeds is when we actually are saying we are the church. We are who God wants us to be. I want to invite Pastor Schumann up to share some of his vision for the whole idea of faith and deeds, compassion uh, and outreach. And uh, you guys know Pastor Schumann. He preached regularly. Uh, I just want to say this guy is the real deal. I love him to death. Um, uh, he's been trying to mimic my facial hair, but kind of swayed from that in the most recent months. It's a reverse halo. Yeah, a reverse halo. <laughs> Um, Pastor Schumann loves Jesus deeply. He loves God's word deeply. He's an excellent preacher, and he really deeply cares for those who are hurting. He loves being around people who are in need of God's healing touch, and he's drawn to that. Uh, and I found that whatever he needs to do, if you add the word food to it, his joy level goes up <laughs> two notches. Pastor Schumann, you're on. Share with us your hope and vision for what God has for our church. Thank you. But before I share, I have a prayer. I just got a text that uh, Matt Robbins is back. Uh, his daughter's been sick, Abby. They did uh, colonoscopy, endoscopy, and all that. Nothing uh, is, has been found. So everything is okay. But she's taking medications. So we just uh, let's just take a few... Uh, minutes to pray over uh, Robin's family. Heavenly Father, we are uh, so grateful for Matt, Joy, and their family. They are serving you in Ghana. And uh, Lord, uh, it's God's work. And we pray to you, God, that you who provide richly will watch over uh, Robin's family, that you will bring healing to Abby and be with Matt, Joy, and uh, the rest of the family at this time. Lord, just watch over them, bless them, heal them, and use them for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Everyone was introducing, you know, all the Kyle and Glenn introduced their family. So I want to share something deep about myself. Uh, I will leave some pictures to share uh, where I come from. That's the first picture. Uh, can you re recognize me? It's in the middle. This was years before I was introduced to Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Oh, all right. Oh, there it is. Right here, I'm holding a cricket ball. I was a fast bowler. In baseball ter terms, I was a pi pitcher. And I had a mean right hand. So this was way back when. So I did play sports, and I did wear skinny pants uh, way before you guys came along. So I, you know, I tell my uh, uh, fellow pastors that uh, before the style came along, I was way ahead. Uh, so the next picture is my beloved mom and I. She still lives in India, in Kolkata, India. Uh, I, I'm going to go visit her this year. So that's my mommy. And the third picture is my family in the U.S. That's my wife, Jody, my son, Jay, Nikki, and we are at our favorite spot in Monterey, enjoying a beautiful day. So that's me, and uh, that's who I am. I come from India. I have been in the States for 26 years. Uh, I came to know Lord Jesus in the U.S., 
And I know what he means to me because I have seen what life could be without Christ. So it's my privilege to be uh, in charge of care and outreach ministry. Now, there are four attributes of a healthy church. And these are people consistently coming to Christ. People consistently living with a sense of hunger for God. People consistently serving with their gifts. People consistently loving and caring for each other. And it's beautiful that my job description covers all of them. When we talk about church as a body of Christ, I also like to imagine this body having three movements. Bodies need to move. The first movement of the Christ body is to reach up. See, reaching up with your both hands is a universal sign of being a child before a parent. When we had our kids, we would go to the mall, they would get tired of walking, and Nikki would raise her hands and say, up, up. So when we raise our arms and praise God, what we are saying, God, up, up, we are nothing without you. The first movement of a church is to reach up. That's prayer. When Jesus was training his disciples on evangelism, or uh, the, when he was ready to send them out to reach people for Christ, for the kingdom of God, this is what he says. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Harvest is people ripe for God, for God's kingdom. You know, Jesus witnessed people who were hungry, who were struggling, who were dying, are suffering, and they were ripe. They were ready. They said, we have had it with this world, with this life. We want God. We want kingdom of God. But the problem is they didn't have, Jesus didn't have enough workers to go out and tell them about the kingdom of God, about Jesus. But guess what? Jesus is not so worried about stats because he knows the one to whom the harvest belongs. That is God. And he doesn't say strategize first. He doesn't say read seven principles of church growth first. Those are all good things and we need to know. The first thing he says, ask the Lord of the harvest. That is pray, pray, pray. That's where it all begins. Because when we talk about mission of God, what we are saying, mission belongs to God. And my privilege, by the way, I cannot take credit for this. This ministry called the prayer ministry has been a part of this church for a very long time. And I just have this great privilege of overseeing this prayer ministry. Next slide. It's a prayer ministry team we have. Meets Tuesdays, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And great things happening. Sue Vigay, one of the leaders of the prayer ministry team, likes to say, prayer changes you as it changes those for whom you pray. And it does. Prayer works. I have a pastor friend whose uh, mom was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. Guess what? She's alive and she's serving God because the church prayed for her. And I'm not saying all the prayers are answered, but does, God does answer prayer. So if you are interested in receiving prayer, if you are interested in joining in this movement that we call Prayer Saturated Church, that's what we want to do, this church, that every aspect of this church is drenched in prayer. So if you want to be part of this movement, just fill out that connection card and say, hey, I want to be part of the prayer team and we'll get in touch with you. Or just show up Tuesday at 7 o'clock room 109, and pray with us. The second movement of a healthy church is this. It's reach in. We are all good about reaching out to people doing work, but we also have to focus on people who are inside, and we have to reach in. This is what Jesus said. A new command I give you, Love one another as I have loved you. 
So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When I was a pastor in rural Iowa, we had a widow whose husband was a farmer and he passed away. And she was part of our church. Guess what? Every farmer in our church, every year, used to harvest her field and give her the proceed. That's how church ought to work. We also had a couple of people in my first church who were great at volunteering outside. Most loving people. They would serve in food pantry and they would hug everyone coming in. But you put those two together in church kitchen, God help us. <laughs> we need to be caring for each other because it's a lot harder to live together than to go out and serve people we don't know. But the challenge and the growth happens when we come together, love on each other, care for each other. And what Jesus is saying, this is also missional. People looking in, uh, seeing a community, loving each other across racial, ethnic, political divide, across socioeconomic divide, will go, wow. This is the group I want to belong to. Because this is the group that will be the future of the world. It is the beginning of the kingdom of God. We care for each other in the family. And this church is great at doing that because we got numerous ministries. Once again, I have the honor of being the pastoral overseer. But these ministries are run by people. Great leaders. And they serve people in this church. They care for people. For example, the Stephen ministry. It's a ministry uh, led by lay leaders who are well trained. This is a caring ministry, a listening ministry. Guess what? You ask therapists, psychologists, everyone will say people need to tell their story in order to be healed. And these people are trained in listening well. Great ministry. If you have pain, we can connect you to a Stephen ministry leader who would listen to you. The next ministry is Celebrate Recovery. And we have Daniel back there. He's the one who leads Celebrate Recovery. It's about healing lives, bad habits, hang-ups, and hurts. If you're struggling in life with whatever issue, come to this Christian Christ-centered 12 Steps program on Sunday night. And join Celebrate Recovery. Then we have marriage ministry. We got great premarital counselors who have been married for years. They know all the issues more than I do. And they are walking with people towards a healthy marriage. They, this ministry also offers classes for continuing uh, uh, health of uh, our marriages. Then we have counseling ministry. We have our licensed counselor who is part of this church. But we also have a mental health team that educates people about mental health issues. Also refers people uh, to counselors in the community. This uh, ministry is just starting off as we are becoming more and more aware of mental health issues. Lastly, we have care ministry that provides meal uh, for families going through crisis provides uh, gifts or help families celebrate new birth. But this is also a core of what I do. It's a, it is the hospital visitation, home visitation, meeting with people, people going through hard times, people needing advice, people uh, just wanting to talk. This is the care ministry that uh, is there for you if you just need to come and unload. I'm there for you. Just call me up. This is what we do when we become a church that reaches in and takes care of the people. The last movement of the body of the, called the church is this. Reach out. 
Because we want to grow as a family. We want people to come in and become part of this church. God's people be transformed. And for that reason, we are called to reach out. Now, how do we reach out? There are multiple ways. If you look at Jesus' example, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every diseases and sickness among the people. Jesus was not only proclaiming, but also healing and driving out demons. Jesus was doing both. Sometimes we are good at proclaiming, telling people about Jesus. Sometimes we are not good at doing. Jesus did both. And sometimes we are good at doing without having the courage to tell people about Jesus. We might feel that we will be judged, we will be called intolerant. But guess what? We believe that Jesus called us to tell people about Jesus and about the kingdom of God. And we do both. Why do you think Jesus did both? Because without the proclamation, the good deeds lose context. Why Jesus doing what he is doing loses context. And without the good deeds, the proclamation loses power. Jesus did both. When he healed people, when he cured sickness, he was telling them, Hey, guys, I'm preaching the, uh, that the kingdom of God is near. Let me show you. Let me give you the appetizer of what it would be like. When God comes, when his kingdom comes, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the devil will be driven out. And all the symbols of darkness, such as sickness, demon possession, physical problems, will all be gone. And let me show you, I'll heal. I'll drive out demons. And that's what we are called to do. And we have teams doing just that. We have the faith, compassion, and justice ministry that's proclaiming, proclaiming the gospel by doing great deeds. What they're telling people that the kingdom of God is coming, and when it comes, there will be no human trafficking. There will be no abuse of the environment. There will be no poverty by providing shelters for the homeless, by giving food to the needy. The faith, compassion, and justice ministry is living out the proclamation. And then we have the global ministry team. That is the world mission team. You see, Jesus called his disciples when he gave the great commission. He said, go be my witness in Jerusalem. That was their local Davis area. Jerusalem. Judea, that is uh, their Sacramento area, and to the ends of the world. And we have global ministry team going to the ends of the world on, on short-term mission tri uh, trips and also sponsoring missionaries who are serving other countries of this world. And lastly, we are forming an evangelism team. Like I said, we are good at doing what Jesus called us to do. The justice piece. Healing. Taking care of the physical needs of the people. But sometimes we shy away from evangelism. Shy away from people. Telling people directly about the love of Jesus Christ. That God loves them. And that's what we need to do well in this church. When I was in Sioux City, Iowa, working for a great company called Sinclair Gas Station, overnight, every morning, a couple would come in to deliver a newspaper, Bill and Blanche Cole. And while they delivered newspaper, they took the time to witness to me, to share the love of Jesus. See, you don't have to quit your work and go somewhere to be a missionary. You can be a missionary where God has placed you. You could do simple things like Mother Teresa said with great love. And tell people about Jesus. If any of these ministries, local, faith, compassion, and justice, global ministry, care ministries, 
interest you. If you are an evangelist by heart and want to serve Jesus, I invite you, fill out that connection card today and say, hey, I'm an evangelist by heart. I want to serve this church and serve the kingdom. If you need care ministry, I want a Stephen's ministry leader. Just fill out the connection card. We'll get in touch with you. That's my job description. The best job description you could have. To love people, to love Jesus, and serve people who are outside. Isn't that great? And we got a great pastor. Uh, stay, stay up here with me. The early church was really good news to its community. The way they loved each other and those around them really gave them goodwill in their community. And they were able to share the good news as a result. That's who we want to be. We want to be uh, followers of Jesus both in word and deed. Will you join me as I pray for Schumann and close our service? Lord, I thank you for Pastor Schumann. I thank you for his family. Lord, we ask a blessing of protection on him. God, we thank you for all the people already involved in all the ministries he just mentioned. We pray more would be involved. And that we would really be good news to our world and our local community in both what we say and what we do. And that people would know who you truly are as a result. Pray, God, that we are people of faith and deeds. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.